Number 10, the end of an era. 1914, a super important dude in Sarajevo got capped in the back of his convertible. Some people are super cool about this, and others are not so super cool about this. So uncool, in fact, that they want to try out all the new fancy weapons and gadgets from the state of the art technology that they've been stockpiling for years. The Ottomans, seeing that their empire was in a decline, saw an opportunity to solidify their place in Europe, strengthen their empire, and maybe just take some stuff from weaker countries. I hear Arabia has lovely sand and oil this time of year. So, how do we achieve victory, some Ottomans thought to themselves. It makes most sense to really join the stronger side, so that way we can almost guarantee our victory and be sitting at the right end of the negotiation table. Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire would form the Central Powers during the First World War. It went very well for the Central Powers for about five minutes before the whole thing went cow otters up. Germany was bogged down in the east and the west, Austria was having a difficult time with the Russians, the Ottoman Empire learned that building railways through someone else's country to take their stuff isn't very cool. When the smoke settled, the once mighty and powerful Ottoman Empire dissolved. Hundreds of years of great wealth and conquest gone within a few short years after World War I had ended. It's almost as if they shouldn't have gotten involved in the first place. Number 9 Execute Order 66. When you get big like the Ottoman Empire, you need protection. You need something that's really gonna protect you. The United States has the Navy SEALs, the British has the Special Air Service. And I have a collection of 80s movies that's so nerdy, it protects me and chases off any cute girl who comes near me. But the Ottomans were thinking ahead by introducing the Janissary Corps, a unit of elite troopers who were the first modern standing army in Europe. Paid regular salaries, disciplined, and was one of the first militaries to have extensive use of firearms. Completely loyal to the Sultan, the Janissaries were a formidable fighting force. What happened to the Janissaries, I hear my bumblebees asking? Well, it's not so nice. A messy political climate was going to disband the core. Not liking the replacements coming in after the Janissaries, they revolted. Which led to something known as the Auspicious Incident, where the barracks burnt down and 4,000 Janissaries lost their lives. Any remaining Jedi were hunted down and destroyed. Sorry, I meant Janissaries. Watched too much Star Wars in preparation for Boba Fett. All jokes aside, that was pretty cruel. You shouldn't, you shouldn't burn people down like that, man. Not so cool. But the comparison between the two, it's there. Star Wars, uh, Star Wars is cool. Number eight. Where art thou, brother? Kings will be kings, and the male patriarchy will be the male patriarchy. You want your dynasty to continue? Then you need a male heir. Like most European kingdoms, this is just how it goes. The Ottomans were no different, except maybe their version of the royal family game. See, the Ottomans like to compete for the throne, meaning if you got brothers, you're gonna have to fight them for it. But not like the fight over the Xbox controller, no, these brothers would be fighting for life or death, oftentimes and having a lot of bloodshed in order to determine the next ruler. In one extreme case, one sultan had his infant brother strangled to make sure his spot on the throne was secured, which is totally a normal human, kind loving thing to do. I'm happy to say we no longer do this, right? Number seven, the air factory. Now this makes sense when you think about it. Ottomans had siblings duking it out in the streets and cradles because of harems. Relax, late night users of the internet, it's a little bit different than what you think that means. Okay, yes, it was a room full of women and ladies of the evening, but these women actually held some political power. An example of this is an extremely influential time for these women that became to be known as the Sultanate of Women. Mothers of sultans often helped choose women for their sons, which I'm sure is the worst blind date ever, and once the women were pregnant, they were no longer permitted to be with the sultan. That child, if born a son, would take a position with his mother in governing a province. There's a lot of rules of this thing, and pretty messed up, but I think if there's something to take away from this, like we should do with all history really, is when you make the succession of your country messy, the politics get messy, and when that happens, you're at the risk of revolution. Number six. Classic humanity. Here I am again talking about YouTube's least favorite S word. I'm here to give you the buzz in history, and that's just how it goes. Probably the worst invention that we've ever come up with since war, but alas, it happened, and it happened in the Ottoman Empire too. It was pretty easy to get rich off the backs of those you whip. What's so messed up is how long it lasted. I'll give you a second to figure out how long. Go ahead, go ahead. Guess what year it ended in? 1908. Yeah, they kept it going until 1908. 
While the anti-S word movement had done their best to remove this heinous activity, it is speculated that it continued up until the 1930s, specifically the trade and sale of women for the deed of deeds. Now you know something's messed up when that outlives your empire. The Ottoman Empire was dissolved shortly after this during the First World War. Number 5. Semper Fi Ok, you've traveled back in time, you said to yourself, hey, I played tons of video games. I love ancient civilizations. I too wish to be a part of amassing army where we will vanquish our foes and gallantly fought battles. Once we reign victorious, we shall celebrate with a feast of grandeur and wine to soak our troubled souls. I am so pleased with the display of the enemy's blood that I am not even going to bathe for a week. Oh, the contraire, my chivalry late night gamers. The Ottomans were quite the opposite. The Janissaries were an elite force, but the officers in the military had very strict rules. When setting up camps, there was to be no consumption of alcohol. A strict rationing and sanitation was to be very important. You think how tough being in an army like that would be? How far a little rest and relaxation will go. Come on, lighten up, guys. Number four, the rifle or the pen. When the Ottomans had taken Constantinople, it was treated as an absolute win. And for the Ottomans, it kind of was. For every Christian still in the city, not so much. A lot of them were killed or sold into the situation that Anakin Skywalker left Tatooine for. As their empire grew, they began to take children at a young age. And when I say take, I mean take kids that weren't exactly theirs to take in the first place and convert them to Islam. And give them two choices. You're either a politician or you're going to be a soldier. The politicians surprisingly reached some higher levels of power, but now if this were me, I know I'd end up in the army. I was never too bright. This actually kind of makes sense though. The idea was to create an army of completely loyal soldiers to the Sultan and government bodies that everyone could trust. Cruel, but effective. Number 3. Jailhouse King So eventually people in the Ottoman Empire were not okay with brothers impersonating Abel and Cain. After all, this bloodshed is rather pointless, there's gotta be a better way to choose the next ruler of this empire and still keep everyone alive. How about house arrest? The solution to solve the next heir and to have brothers not be unalive was to keep them in cafes. No, not coffee shops, lavish prisons for princes to be exact. Cafe literally translates to cage, and it's where the heirs spent their time locked up away safe from harm. Not allowed to leave, but allowed to have female visitation if you catch my drift. It sounds like a good idea, but locking up somebody for long periods of time then expecting that person to rule a country that they barely know or seen is kinda messed up. Also, no streaming services and Wi-Fi would make that the worst day ever. I'd give them this place two stars, man. Number two, impressive run. Okay, yeah, the Ottomans did some messed up stuff. I called the chief again last night and he said it wasn't it, but that goes for all civilizations of the past. What's really messed up though is how long the Ottoman Empire lasted. From medieval times to the earliest 20th century, which is pretty close to the modern era. Over 600 years of conquering the Balkans, Middle East, North Africa, and the Caucasus. Like I've said before, you don't get that big and powerful without breaking a few eggs to make your omelets along the way. I am generalizing, but the Ottoman Empire was one of the most powerful empires to ever exist, and one of the longest. Encompassing roughly 20 million square kilometers at its peak, had a population of 35 million citizens. Number 1. A Man You Can Trust Ok, so room full of scantily clad women has to be protected, right? I mean come on, who's gonna help? You need someone strong obviously, but you also need somebody you can trust. Someone who will not fall for their devilishly good looks and try to take one of those wives away from your harem. Good thing the Ottomans had eunuchs on speed dial, or rather just had a lot from pillaging other nations and just kinda kept, kept them around. But as silly as it might sound, it does make sense. How could a man be tempted to do bed with a woman if he's missing his long John Silver? Right? Number 10. Unproud History Blame it on my Canadian education, dyslexia, or me just being an idiot, but it took me three times to read over properly Moogle instead of Mongol. Moogle, Mongol, Moogle. Mongol. It also took me a second to realize that I'm talking about India, not Mongolia. It's okay, folks. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drink some water and touch some grass. I'll be okay. <laughs> yes, the Mughal Empire. As it turns out, my confusion is semi-appropriate, as the Mughals were descendants of the mighty Kangas Khan, hence the Mongols. Makes a lot of sense now that you think about it. Turkic Mongols, to be exact, the Mughals were well aware of the Mongols' reputation and their history. Let's just say they weren't too proud of it. Eh, you can't blame them. However, they were more proud of their Tamir sided heritage. Honestly, like I said, you can't blame them. It's kind of like your dad's side of the family, you know? They're okay, but 
Everyone likes mom's side better. That's just how it goes. Number nine, Might of Ahoms. The Galactic Empire, the NCR, and the Mughals. What do all these large organized militaries share in common? They can all be defeated by a bunch of scruffy looking ragtags who spend too much time on mentats and in their X-Wings. All sci-fi jokes aside, the Ahoms were a tribal people who happened to live in the wrong neighborhood per se. Thing is, these guys had some serious grit. As in when dueling against the mighty Mughal Empire, they were not victorious once, twice, or three times, but a total of 17 times. 17, that's a lot. At a certain point, you've got to respect a group for kicking your butt that many times. At some point, you just got to throw in the towel and say, hey, let, let, let them keep the land. They can have it. It's theirs. I don't need it. I don't want it. Number eight, smoke. Love it or hate it. Smoking has been a part of life for a long time. Longer than you might think, actually. No, not the age of Marlboro Cowboys and ad litter telling you not to. No, hacking a dart of the past was a little bit different than getting mad at the Leafs when they're losing and you're having a break outside. Interesting enough, however, it's speculated that the hookah, or the shisha, was invented by one of the emperor's top doctors of the time. Naturally, this was something safe for the elite because, well, you can't have peasantry damaging their lungs, come on. They might need those bad boys after all, with all the work they do and stuff. Number seven, science and big booms. We've come a very long way in history, some might say too far. We've got cars, computers, and depending on who you ask, we've been to the moon. I say we have, it just makes sense. Come on guys. I mean, come on, obviously we have, because the moon is made of cheese, and that's where we get cheese, right? That's that's where we that's what my mom said, we, we cheese from there, right? Well, there certainly was no rocket ships back then, but the scientific advancement is what is to note here. The Mughal Empire was a big contributor of the Islamic scientific revolution, as there were many contributions in math, algebra, and other useful inventions. They were one of the first to use black powder. What does that mean? Uh, besides fireworks, it means blam blams. And if you know history or anything about the time period, you know how important blam blams are. Part of the uh, black powder empires, as they're called. Number six, Taj Mahal. Husbands and wives. Marriage. Beautiful marriage. The whole sanctimony that brings lovers together. Now, I'm sure all of our viewers at home will agree in saying marriage was the best thing they ever did and absolutely not a training experience after 15 years. Right guys? Shah Jahan would agree with that. The mighty emperor who went great lengths for his beloved wife. Now I'm sure you know the story, but in case you don't, this was the man that was so heartbroken from his wife's passing, so distraught, that he built the Taj Mahal. That's like your partner at home saying, you know what, babe, I love you so much. Bam, there's the Empire State Building. There it is, look at it, that's for you. The Taj Mahal is the crown jewel of Mughal architecture, and at the time cost around $1 billion with our inflation. Every year, the Taj Mahal brings thousands of tourists to witness its ivory beauty. It is a beautiful building, can't, can't lie about that, but a billion dollars? <sighs> Man, she must have loved that woman, must have loved her, god dang. Number five, the Queen of India. So this massive and powerful empire, why is it not around anymore? I mean, in reality, we just don't do the whole empire thing anymore, unless you're Heisenberg, because he's in the empire business. But what's the main reason why they're not around anymore? Do you hear that? It's the Queen's Navy coming to shore, and the boats are chock full of redcoats. Look out, India, they're coming for your tea. Unfortunately for those living in India and the Mughal Empire at the time, this was sort of like the beginning of the end. As some years later, India would be brutally forced into one of the many colonies of the British Commonwealth. And yeah, did I mention brutal? Because it was pretty brutal. It wasn't the nicest of occupations, the British ruled over for many, many years, until a certain peace-loving Gandhi came years later and set the record straight. Number 4. Relatable King Akbar of the Mughal Empire was a very notable leader, but today I'm talking about him for some other reasons. One that I can relate to personally. No, I'm not a secret king and have a palace of my own full of servants, although, I mean, if you guys want to pay me king, I'm, I wouldn't say no. I mean, yeah. It's well noted that Akbar was illiterate, which for royalty was rare back then, since that's usually the only people who can read or are allowed to read. Can't have the peasantry being too smart now, can't have that. However, some historians suggest that his literacy isn't to blame for a lack of trying, but it's dyslexia. Yeah, that's right. It's the same reason why I hated reading as a kid. And in high school, sorry, English teachers, you can just Google Cliff Notes, it's the future. Akbar, however, did not have Cliff Notes. He had the option to hire artists to illustrate beautiful works of art in order to comprehend some things that needed visualization since he couldn't read. 
I did not possess such powers. However, still, still up the bait. You know, if you guys want to make me king, that's fine. I'm okay with it. Number three, cholera belts. Okay, this one is just too weird not to mention. So in the end of the Mughal Empire, there were lots of British around. That's kind of how the occupation goes. Lots of red coats and whatnot. However, it wasn't exactly an easy job for the British either. Some folks just don't like being ruled over. I wouldn't. Interesting enough though, there was also a fair share of sicknesses going around. And when you think about it, that means you take a whole bunch of people, mix them in with another population of a bunch of people, to a place they've never been before, added with it's not the most hygienic time in history, sprinkling a little hot weather, and yeah, people are probably gonna get sick. Cholera, to be exact. Cholera was a big one. So, what's the solution? How do we cure this cholera? Is it, is it hand washing, hygiene? So, you know, do we keep our distance? What, what do we do? Well, the answer was cholera belts. And basically, it's just a piece of red flannel fabric to wrap around your belly. That's how you cure cholera. At the time, cholera was thought to be caused by a chilly or cold belly. So, warm up your belly, no more cholera. But in India, where it's really hot, and places like that around there in the Mughal Empire, it's kind of hot anyway, so I don't know why you need that. It doesn't really add up. Number two, diamonds. The Kohanir diamond was literally the crown jewel of the Mughal Empire. A jewel worth more than anyone could really handle for the time, and uh, definitely today. It's too much for you. You don't want it. Too much pressure. You can never sell it. It used to be encrusted upon the Mughal throne, but after some violent disagreements, it was stolen and it passed hands, where it then went to someone else in their hands. And after that, then someone else had it. And then somebody else had it. And then, like a trinket your grandma tries to give you, it probably sat in her basement for a very long time before then it ended up in the hands of old blighty herself, Queen Victoria. Who else? And either if you think that's fair or not, it's been a part of the British crown jewels ever since. Because they take stuff, that's what they do. Number one, Anna Carley. A classic tale of love and betrayal. And maybe it actually didn't happen. Historians aren't too sure about this one. But if it is true, oh baby, what a juicy story. Anna Carley was a poor peasant, but worked her way up to becoming Akbar's wife. Uh, but she also tripped, fell, and landed in somebody else's bedroom, if you know what I mean. Naturally, Akbar was cheesed. So he did the next sensible thing and had her buried alive in the walls like Bowser did to the Toads in Mario 64. However, no amount of Power Stars could help us find out if she really even existed. The story of the Forbidden Love, however, has been retold countless times in Asian culture. I was going to go for a Count of Monte Cristo reference that was stuck in the walls, but I feel like you guys know Mario 64 better. Pop culture beats books, right? Who reads books? Number 10. The Blade, the Wife, and the Horse? If you love something, you gotta let it go. Or how about parading your naked wife in front of your friends in the mighty Roman military? Emperor Caligula was so impressed with his wife's beauty, he just thought he had to share it, even though apparently she wasn't that attractive, and already had children with another man. Scandalous. If she had wheels, she'd be the town bike, if you know what I'm saying. As if displaying your wife's gratuitous curves isn't scandalous enough, apparently he would use very real threats as a strange way of flirting. Clearly this was a dude who's got some issues. Like for example, the one time he wanted to humiliate the Roman Senate by claiming to make his horse a council. Although he didn't actually go through with it. Still though, this one's all sixes and nines, innit? This may have been related to a brothel caught disease. He might, he might have had syphilis, I'm just saying. That's my Number nine, no grain. Max Minimus Thrax was like most Roman emperors. Seized power when he wanted, seized land when he wanted, pretty much did whatever he wanted. Strangely enough, however, he cut subsidies for grain. This was one of the many tactics to help up cover for increased taxes. Taxes that were imposed because he had doubled the pay of the military during constant military action. That's a lot of coins needed. Eventually, the people had had enough. And ironically, his own guards poked him with spears until he couldn't be poked anymore. I'm not a military expert or anything, but if you're gonna wage war, you gotta have the money for it. It's kind of like when the ice cream truck comes around and you're counting quarters for a large chocolate cone because you're 12 and life is hard and you deserve it. I love the ice cream truck. Number eight, Red Roman. 
Emperor Caracalla was also like many other Roman emperors, as he was quite bloodthirsty and honestly just a bad dude. He unalived his brother Geta just because he didn't like him. Good reason, I guess. Then 20,000 of his brother's followers persecuted and killed. When some good folks heard about this terrible news, and were horrified, rightfully so, I mean who wouldn't be, they too were dealt with in a non-YouTube conduct safe way. He depleted the treasury from war and let foreigners have Roman citizenship. Now I know that sounds like a good thing, but it isn't. In already trying times, it completely messed up Roman societal culture. In a sense, fire is good, it allows us many things. But Carcola threw a whole jerry can of gasoline on the fire by doing that. When your society is built on one thing, perhaps it's a good idea to not totally flip that upside down overnight. As quick decisions like that lead to quick downfalls. Just saying though, just, just saying. Number 7. The light of my life. Emperor Nero was straight up just not a cool guy. This whole list could be about him, but I'm here to make you laugh, not horrify you with the horrors of Pax Romana. Nero, like most emperors, was very wealthy, the kind of wealth that only people who shop at Whole Foods can understand. As it turns out, there was a fire in Rome at the time, burned for a long time, pretty, pretty big deal. Who started the fire? Uh, no one really knows, even though Nero himself might be a suspect. However, it would be really easy to get rid of a group of people you don't like if you blame it on them. So it was blamed on the hot new religion at the time, you gotta love them, Christians, except Nero didn't, and he was kind of egotistical, so in order to punish the scapegoated Christians, he had them set ablaze, so there was more light in his garden, so to speak, or that's what is said, at least. I know sometimes we can all disagree with our faith, but lighting each other on fire is not the answer. Mom always said if you have nothing nice to say, then don't light people on fire. Okay, Mom. Number 6. Not so Hercules. Commodus was like many other emperors in thinking that he was very close to the gods, but Commodus thought he was a Greek god and reincarnated Hercules to be exact. So much so that he would often take up a role as a gladiator, which a lot of Romans thought was scandalous as a leader. A leader shouldn't be dealing with the barbarians at our gates and other lands that were persecuting and invading and taking over, rather than performing in blood sports. It was thought that this was below the office of the emperor. Rumors began to stir that because of his love for the arena, he may not be the royal bloodline claimed to be. When in the arena, his adversaries always surrendered. So. He always won. In return, he wouldn't kill them, to be fair, just scarred them as it was seen to be a good thing to be bested by the emperor and then to leave with a mark. Sure, we'll go with that. Apparently, they also brought animals in for him to slaughter in the arena for entertainment. Eventually, people had enough of him wasting time and money playing gladiator games. And he was strangled by his coach. Oh, hey coach, I'm ready for the next match. How you doing? Hey, what, why are you looking at me like that, man? What's wrong? And, and what's that rope for? Number 5. Last Best Hope Romulus Augustulus was the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire. History gets kind of crazy after this point, but let's be real, what's more scandalous than being the last ruler of your empire? Could he have saved it? Would the world have looked different if he did? Truth be told, not a lot of records survived his reign, so we don't really know. Perhaps it's because he didn't have much time to write things down. Or maybe because he was still a minor when he inherited the failing Roman Empire. Or really it was because Rome's worst nightmare had come true. The barbarians at the gates had taken over Rome. The German barbarian general Odoker took over and claimed himself to be the king of Italy, which ushered in the end of the great western Roman Empire. Talk about scandal. Number 4. Excess, excess, excess. Emperor Elagabalus is what I think of when I think of a Roman emperor. Someone who is pampered in a time where most people don't have access to really anything easily. Eating grapes off the vine, bottles of wine, and your servants are looking fine. Alright, alright, alright. His life of decadence was also matched with a classic level of unaliving those who oppose you or rather groups that you feel need to be persecuted. Even more scandalous than that is the question of his sexuality. Oh. While being debated by historians today, there are rumors that the decadent emperor may have been having a relationship with his male chariot driver. There's also rumors of the emperor wearing women's clothes. Very scandalous indeed, oh handsome emperor. Number 3. Senate Purge I am the Senate. Said Tiberius knowing that he had a really cool name. 
While not the worst emperor on this list, he did purge the Senate in times of political unrest, just like everyone's favorite space emperor and one of my worst impressions. He wasn't a popular choice for the job, as he really only came to power through a series of misfortunes. All of this leads to a lackluster leader who, when he retired to an island off the coast of Italy, rewarded his mediocre work with some stuff to do with younger people that uh, I just can't say on YouTube. Apparently, he became a heavy drinker and got himself involved in all kinds of vices. It is speculated that Emperor Caligula was a child on this island and may have witnessed this debauchery. It's speculated that this may have influenced his acts of sin, and honestly, not sure what to call as these guys, I mean, these guys are, I don't know what you call this, these guys are all messed up, man, I don't know, they're just crazy. Number two, no holidays. Septimus Severus sounds like a brothel related disease in the Harry Potter universe. But actually, he was a traditional guy. He liked things Roman and wanted to keep it that way. So, when the Jewish and Christian faith made their way to Rome, he wasn't a happy guy. So he had them persecuted. The only thing saving these people from a short Roman sword was if they worshipped the emperor and the emperor gods as well. For some reason, that made him a little more forgiving. However, considering he wasn't the only emperor to feel this way, I would think again before decorating a Christmas tree or lighting a menorah in Rome. Of course, I'm only making humor of what probably was an awful time for those religious factions. We like to romanticize Rome, but she's not all perfect. Number 1. Eye for an Eye Empress Irene of the Eastern Roman Empire may have been a woman, but was just as ruthless and bloodthirsty as her male counterparts. While a lot of people probably had an issue with her leading as a woman, I'd like to hope more people today have a problem with her politics and how she came to power. A little unaliving here, cozying up over there, playing the game until she got what she wanted. And there was this one time that she wasn't too happy with her son's politics, and it was likely he was going to have her power removed, so he needed to go on a timeout. She had some guards gouge his eyes out, which mortally wounded him. No big deal or anything. I guess there was no timeout corner back then. I went to Rome to the chief's palace. He bestowed upon me this wisdom after learning about Irene. That ain't it. Number 10. Great Death Pit. If you are a Sumer king, you likely professed yourself a god and or a superhuman demigod. As such, your followers and members of court were required to treat you as such, with a level of devotion Andrew saves only for his collection of empty drink bottles he keeps at his desk. Can you please clean that up? Hey! What I'm sure Andrew doesn't expect from those empty bottles is that when he bites the dust, they too must do the same to accompany him to the afterlife. Sumerian kings absolutely did. The biggest example of this ritualistic offing would be the Great Pit of Delifing, discovered in 1922, which was the resting place of approximately 1,800 people, all of which served different kings and queens in the Sumerian capital city of Ur. Some of these followers may have been poisoned, others had a less than ceremonious demise as they had prominent holes in what should be rather intact parts of their skulls. Number 9. Hanging Gardens Here's a quote from Greek philosopher Strabo. The ascent to the highest story is by stairs, and at their side are water engines, by means of which persons appointed expressly for the purpose and are continually employed in raising water from the Euphrates into the garden. Namaste. Yes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon! I said it twice, oh my goodness, must be kind of cool. What a magnificent sight it must have been, a magnificent construction of beauty, even predating the pyramids of Giza by a rough estimate of 5,000 years. We'll get to that later. Trouble is, this one is kind of a gray area. Here's the later. It could be completely made up by Strabo and others like him, or it could have been destroyed as there are some depictions of a garden existing in a grand palace on the River Tigris near modern day Mosul, but ah, we're just not sure. We're not, we're not exactly sure. So beautiful gardens, I hope they were there. Number eight, Sumer. The Sumerians were the oldest known civilization in Mesopotamia. They created the first cities, and a large part of their success and the success of the Mesopotamians in general was due to the invention of irrigation. The land around the Tigris and Euphrates was not so great. It was fertile but prone to flooding pretty often. The solution was to divert water from canals into irrigation ditches. The Mesopotamians realized that the water supply from rivers was unreliable, so they dug a maze of ditches from the rivers to their fields. This created a reliable water source for farming. The crops fed the population, and farmers were able to trade the excess produce such as onions, garlic, apples, figs, grapes, and pomegranates. That's how the Mesopotamians really flourished. Number 7. Hammurabi's Law 
Law students and those taking the bar rejoice because I am talking about Hammurabi's code. When folks were flocking into cities for the first time, the crime rate would have been something to take note of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. King Hammurabi made his code of laws, 282 to be exact, to give justice to all. Like in the commercial sector, for example, for those who steal. The principle of an eye for an eye, to make the punishment fit the crime. If you were caught stealing, then perhaps the removal of your arm, that stole, shall be an acceptable response. Now look, I'm not out here defending crooks. Don't steal, it's bad. But these laws, ew, a little too cruel for me. I'd go through all of them, but well, you need to get back to your bar exam, so good luck out there, folks. I know you can do it. Number six, the Akkadian Empire. You know you're a big deal when it hasn't been done before you. The Akkadian Empire was literally the first ever empire. They were around for about 100 years and first came to be around 4,300 years ago. And they were big on improving roads and irrigation. Only problem is that irrigation doesn't really help you out much when it stops raining for 290 years. The large southern part of the empire was pretty dependent on the northern part for most, or more like all, of its crops and food. So when a drought struck and took away the food, a panicking northern population went to seek help from their southern brethren, who, in return for all the years of food, put up walls to keep them out. Boom! An inciting incident for a violent conflict that brings down an empire. It's that simple, kiddos. Number 5. The Gentleman's Tablet Hey, at the end of the day, we're only human, and sometimes we do as they do on the Discovery Channel. We wouldn't be here if the people of ancient times did not put on a little Marvin Gaye and just feel the groove, baby. Well, strangely enough, not much has changed since then. And that includes our own curiosity with each other's gabagool. My generation has OnlyFans, the last generation had Playboy and Penthouse, and maybe the Martha Stewart magazine. That woman can do no wrong. Well, folks, in ancient Mesopotamia, they needed their fix too. Playboy was a few thousand years away, so the next best thing was these clay tablets depicting actions that my editors are wondering how they're even gonna show you. This ain't junior high health class. Y'all know how this works. So did the ancients. It's why there's a few of these tablets floating around and uh, in different positions, taking bricked up to a whole new level. Number four, a pillar of flesh. Another empire that rose to prominence in Mesopotamia would be the Assyrian Empire. And the kings here were pretty damn awful. They ruled with bloody iron fists of torture and mass life-ending escapades. One such king, Ashurnasirpal II, inherited a huge, strong army from his father. And using it, he would destroy pretty much anyone who didn't like him in ways that may have left his soldiers with PTSD. Like actually. He burned, blinded, and removed the craniums of rebels, set maidens on fire, and condemned opposing soldiers to die of dehydration in the desert. But I think what may be the worst way he dealt with those who opposed him would be when he flayed all the chiefs who had revolted and built a pillar that he covered with their skin. Hey, I think I, think I feel my lunch coming back up. Andrew, Andrew, get in here. <sighs> no. <sighs> Number three, Sumerian suds. If you're like me, then you'd love a good beer. Frankly, I could drink them ice cold or warm, just like our friends across the pond. Cheers, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. With that being said, I could never enjoy my Canadian lifestyle if it weren't for the Sumerians, as they may have invented the first beer. No more drunk hockey fights, no more cotty weekends in the Muskokas, and no more just sending her buddy. You gotta send her. Being the agricultural revolutionaries that they were, it makes sense that they would discover the fermentation process of wheat. Tablets found in excavations depict people drinking out of large jars that are speculated to be filled with a gorgeous 3.5% brew. Which if you ask me, is the best way to enjoy said beverage, with friends around you in a big jar. Number 2. Gilgamesh Even if you don't know who it is, it's likely you have heard the name Gilgamesh. In Mesopotamia, Gilgamesh was the hero of Uruk. Just like how Big Ched is the hero of my dreams. <laughs> and in said city, stone tablets and even the art on walls tell his stories and legends. That's Gilgamesh, not Andrew. According to the stories, his mother was thought to be the goddess Ninsun, and his father was, give me a sec here, Lugalbanda, the god king of Uruk. And apparently, this half man, half god was the ruler of the city for 126 years, which would be completely insane if it were actually true. It could be, we don't actually know. The second half of the epic poem of Gilgamesh is all about him trying to figure out the meaning of life. And buddy, I mean, same here. 
We're all just dust in the wind, dude. Dust in the wind. Number one, the wheel. The cradle of civilization. There's a lot that happens in Mesopotamia, and Adam and I would need a whole history class to tell you everything that was happening in the Middle East. Maybe one day we'll actually teach a we class. Who knows? Yeah, maybe that'd be a good idea. Yeah. But one thing I can tell you is that thanks to ancient Sumerians, we have wheels. Maybe it was a pottery wheel. Maybe it was for a carriage. Maybe it was because we just like to make stuff. I don't know. But I don't think I need to tell you how important wheels are and how they literally reinvented the wheel. It was extremely revolutionary. Boats, floats, doors, stores, drawers, planes, trains, cars, Mars if you count the rover, bikes, flower mills, gears, cog, clocks, and your 11th grade best friend buddy. He was wheeling and dealing. Number 10, Hanam's baths. Bathing and hygiene are super important. At least that's what my mom tells me. That's why I do my best to shower more than once a week. I'm a man, and I can change if I have to, I guess. Well, baths were actually important to the Mughals as well, being that their heritage was a mix of Asiatic, Euro, Indian, they took a little from everything, and part of that was the Persian baths. The Persian baths were just one of those things they took, called hamans. I hope I'm saying that right. They were social spaces to have baths, stay clean. It was very important back then. Now, bear in mind, if you will, I know some folks at home have issues with public pools because, well, you know, they're, they're full of nastiness and. Well, you'd be right, but today we have things to fight that. Imagine sharing bath water with the entire city, and no one is wearing swim trunks. There's no chlorine pucks, vaccines are at least a thousand years away, and diseases are rampant. Oh, and there's no toilet paper. Jump in, kids, the water's fine, it's nice and fun. Can you imagine? Imagine if I was in the water, you wouldn't want that. That's no good, that's gross. Ew, ew. Number nine, Babber the Writer. I can relate to this quite a lot, actually. So Babur, the mighty warrior and king who brought upon the Mughal Empire, was a man to be respected. Or else it could wind you up in some serious trouble. I'd say hot water, but it's more like stinky bath water. However, while on the outside he was a super tough macho man, on the inside he was a softer, kinder man who not only enjoyed writing, but was also quite the socialite, just like myself. I like, I like going to parties and meeting people, I like, I like making friends. He loved his inner self so much that he started writing his own autobiography. He started the trend of it, actually. His was called Babernama. Good name, I like it. And it detailed major events from his life. On the outside, Adam may look like a nerd, but on the inside, he's one of my dearest friends. I love Adam, he's a great guy. See, there's something nice. Usually we say something rude, but I said something nice this time. He's a great guy. Number eight, Akbar's tolerance. Medieval times. It's safe to say that these times became to be known for their religious persecution. It's kind of how it went. Queen Mary made a career out of burning heretics. Slightly disagree with my church Protestant, even though our overall arcing beliefs are founded in Christianity, and the only thing that separates us is a list of beliefs that really we can work together on? Pff, I don't think so. Away with these heretics. Yeah, that's kind of silly. Well, all long-winded jokes aside, for being a medieval king, Akbar was actually very tolerant of others' religious beliefs. This tolerance of others' beliefs actually aided the Mughal Empire in expanding to other sovereign areas of India, making them a lot stronger than they really should have been. Number seven, the melting pot. Okay, so it's late at night and you haven't been grocery shopping in over a week. Guilty. You're too lazy to get up and get groceries, and you work early tomorrow anyway. Ugh, sucks. However, you're also too motivated, or cheap, to not order takeout, so that's when you raid the cupboard like a teenager looking for munchy Pop-Tarts. You know the feeling. You start throwing everything in a pan and seeing what sticks, throwing in spices that you haven't used in a month. After all, it's said and done, you're left with, well, Whatever the heck that is. The verdict though, is actually pretty good. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Mughal Empire's religious melting pot of religions. I said it twice, but it makes sense. Another point to add here is Akbar's acceptance of other religious values was him coming up with his own called Din In Lanahi, which was the best part of Islam, Hinduism, and other smaller religions in the area. You'd be surprised how well those work together. Number six, Shah Jahan's reign. A lot of times throughout history, the Mughal Empire kind of gets looked over. Most likely because of British invasion and because, well, the British took all their loot and art and uh, national treasures and they're sitting comfortably somewhere in a British museum. But you're not getting them back, they're ours now. But that's the point. The Mughal Empire was no joke. And at one point in history, may or may not have been the wealthiest empire on earth. A center for writing, arts, crafts, and treasures. They had the highest GDP in the world at one point. That's pretty impressive. Makes sense in how they could afford to build places like the Taj Mahal that apparently changed color three times a day because of the sun and its pure white construction. 
Makes a lot of sense when you add it up. Number five, house arrest. Classic story, really. Medieval times is also defined by kings and queens and emperors and leaders handing down their dynasties to male-born heirs. Has to be male, those are the rules, I don't make them up. And sometimes people attempt their best to, well, steal the throne or the crown from underneath their fathers, mothers, uncles, or, or really anyone who's got power and anyone who doesn't. It's, it's kind of how it goes, a vicious cycle. Well, as successful as Shah Jahan was, even his own blood was out for him. His own son, I'm gonna try and pronounce this, Ar Arin Arganzeb, Arganzeb, Organzeb. His own son, Organzeb. That's a hell of a name. It sounds like a super villain. P his own son, Organzeb, put him and his sister under house arrest, doing his best to solidify his place in the throne. When it was all said and done, Shah Jahan had passed away, but sadly, due to his political strife and some family drama that is straight out of all my children, he was not given proper burial rights, which then was a big slap in the face. That sucks, dude. That sucks. You rule country, you're nice to everybody, and then your frickin' son just comes in and stabs you in the back. Number four, Footloose. Remember Footloose, 80s classic movie, right? It's a good movie, it's a feel-good movie. We have some decent music, too. The plot is a little rough, to say the least. I mean, what town would outlaw dancing? I mean, who in their right mind would ever do that? Well, meet King Arganzeb, who banned poetry, music, dancing, and even some writings. May as well just throw Kevin Bacon and dancing in there while you're at it. As a small town, I'd be more worried about what those teenagers are doing after the dance party, not the actual dancing. Arganzeb's concerns were that of religious reform, as in classic medieval times, like previously mentioned. Well, as you can guess, this didn't go very well as the empire was already a well-established place of mixed religion and arts and all the other beautiful culture stuff. Taking that away wasn't going to make the people happy, and it didn't. He struggled to maintain power of a successful empire like his father did. Ew, rough. It's, it's, you know, if you, if you take over and it gets better, fine, but if it's worse, eh, kinda awkward. Number three, the Red Fort. As it turns out, the same architect who built the Taj Mahal also built many other Mughal Empire buildings like the Red Fort. You do good work, you get more work. As simple as that. It's the life of an actor. The Red Fort originally, white and red, hence the name, was the main residence of Mughal emperors after the capital moved from Agra to Delhi. At one point, even held the throne that was encrusted with the crown jewel of the Mughal Empire. It's where did business happen. It was an important building for the empire and culture that still stands today. On Indian Independence Day today, the Prime Minister raises the flag from the fort and addresses the nation. Number two, Humanyun's tomb. Okay, so we all know the Taj Mahal was built for a wife who had passed away by a grieving husband. Well, Humanyun's tomb was built for a husband who had passed away by a grieving wife. The first garden tomb ever constructed, and honestly, when the editor pulls a picture up of this bad boy, it's pretty cool. Considering how old these buildings are, it's impressive it's still standing. Oh, and when I said wife, I actually meant mistress. It was, it was a mistress, uh, built by the side chick, if you will. I wonder how the wife felt. Mm, better not bring that up. If side <laughs> building a palace, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the wifey doing? Well, you know what I'm saying? Jeez. Number one, British imports. Yes, the whole reason Britain tore down an empire and stole some tea and maybe some artifacts. I don't know, I, I, I haven't heard. Or rather had some solid importation of tea coming in every month. Whether or not these farmhands were paid, well, eh, you get the point, you know where I'm going with that. However, more interesting, and I thought I had to bring this up, because it's just so cool, was textiles. It sounds lame, but it's really cool actually. Textiles, cloth, silk, dyes, you name it. Europe did a lot of trade with the Mughals, but Britain, of course, Britain wanted a cap on the market as 95% of their textile goods actually came from the Mughal Empire. So it just made sense to own the whole thing. If you already got 95%, man, just take the whole thing, just take it, it's yours. Number 10, Chandragupta I's marriage to Kumara Devi. One of the first major acts of the Gupta Empire was certainly the first to cement its authority. As Chandragupta I married the Lachavi princess Kumara Devi, he solidified relations between Nepal and India, creating a unique position at the time that allowed for the Gupta's coming expansion. It's theorized that this may not have been a happy marriage, 
marriage. As numismatist John Allen implies that it was a condition of a peace treaty with the Lachavi, which Manu Samhita claims were impure in the Gupta's eyes. Despite that, Chandragupta and Kumara Devi are featured prominently on the coins of the time, which was likely a display of power. Number 9. Samudragupta Following Chandragupta's rule came the rule of Samudragupta, the child of the previous union. Compared to his father, Samudragupta expanded the empire's borders with gusto, to the point where scholars frequently refer to him as the Napoleon of India. Not only that, but a number of recordings describe him as an accomplished artist and a kind ruler who deeply cared for the poor. A great number of coins were minted in his name, featuring him in various poses, and likely cemented him as a classical Indian historical hero, reinstating the royal families of those who lost their kingdoms, whether by his hand or not, it didn't matter. Number eight. Religious Tolerance But Samudragupta was not just a man of the people, he was a man deeply involved with religion. An active worshipper of Vishnu, many records of his achievements have been gleaned from the records of him installing idols to his god in the temples of cities that he'd conquered. That being said, he was known to be extremely religiously tolerant, allowing and actively encouraging other practitioners to worship in his kingdom. One of Samudragupta's favorite rituals was the ritual of Ashvamedha, a ritual where a horse would be released by the king's warriors and left to wander for a year. If the horse entered any rival territory, they could challenge the warriors accompanying the horse. If the horse couldn't be captured or killed within a year, it would be returned to the capital and sacrificed, and the king declared as the sovereign. Number 7. Art Peak I have to stop talking about Samudragupta, but this is a really good reason to. The Gupta Empire was an absolute golden age, in particular for art. Sculpture was easily at its finest here. Just look at the Buddha of the Mathura style. Carved from pink sandstone, these sculptures are so insanely detailed for the material that they're working with. Like, Look at the folds on the fabric, oh my god. A another piece that stands out is the terracotta depiction of Kree Krishna battling Keshi, and absolutely stunning work of action and motion. Not only were the sculptures incredible, but the paintings were fascinating as well, such as the ones from the Ajanta Caves, works of dry fresco. Only a handful of these caves have survived time's cruelty, but the ones that have are remarkable indeed. Number 6. The Allahabad Pillar One of the most important pieces of Indian architecture, the Allahabad Pillar is a massive stone where the exploits of numerous Indian rulers have been inscribed. Constructed from stone, the pillar is thought to have been erected in the 3rd century by the Ashoka, but carries an absolutely staggering amount of history etched onto its surface. Many of the original inscriptions have been lost to time and weather, but many more have survived, least of all the verses detailing the exploits of our boy, Samudragupta. Every single thing that we know about the Gupta can either be gleaned from excavating coins from the time, the documentation of visiting foreign elements, but the majority of it is found here. Relaying all of his exploits would take far too long, as Samudragupta conquered well over 20 kingdoms during his reign, inscribing verses dedicated to them on the Allahabad pillar. Number 5. The Scholars The Gupta Empire was home to a great deal of scholars, notably Vara Hamihira and Arya Bhatta. A great deal of accomplishments that are traditionally claimed to have been made by European scientists during the Renaissance were actually made within the Gupta Empire. This includes the the theory of Earth rotating on an axis, the identification of zero as a number, and the original development of chess, known at the time as Kataranga. We all thought that the Romans were the first to invent the seven day week, right? Uh, wrong, bucko. The concept actually appeared within the Gupta first, and was likely carried over by travelers. Some Euro dude discovered that the Earth was round, right? Wrong, babe. That was all our and the dude even figured out how eclipses worked while everyone else was just freaking out that the sun had disappeared or some nonsense like that. Number 4. Kumara Gupta's founding of Nalanda University While originally beginning life as a Buddhist monastery, Nalanda's history begins with its founding at the hands of Kumara Gupta as a sort of 
Passion Project. This was gleaned from a monarch seal that was found on site, identifying Chakraditya, another name for the emperor of the time. He was not the only contributor named, as a great deal of his successors expanded and grew the university, allowing for studies of a mass and great diversity. This further implies the extreme religious tolerance of the community, going so far as to allow the inscription of multiple different religions deities on their walls. Number 3. Feudatories As we start to draw to the closing of this list, we must begin to discuss the factors that led to the Gupta Empire's eventual downfall. While we'll get into the specifics later, when the Gupta Empire began to lose both money and territory, one of the unique elements was the way in which the empire actually dissolved. Where one might have reigned again, without the guiding hands of the Guptas, India was once more dissolved into numerous kingdoms. Whether the empire was a good place to live remains to be seen. But the most important thing to understand was the way in which it acted as a glue to hold everything together. Without the guiding leadership of the Guptas, the old management became new once more, and things resettled to the way that they'd been two centuries prior. As much as things may be permanent, they can just so easily fall apart. Number 2. The Hun Invasion Oh lord the Huns. Uh, there's a lot to talk about with them, but in regards to the Gupta Empire, their impact was quite severe. The Alkan Huns, led by Tramana and Mihirakula, invaded, managing to take nearly half of the Gupta's northwestern half by the 20th year of their invasion. It would take another 28 years for a grand total of 48 for the Alkan Huns to finally be repelled by King Yahodarman. The effects of this prolonged conflict saw the Gupta's power having been seriously diminished. Everything they built had just begun to collapse, from religion to finances. Even if the Huns didn't take the empire in conquest, they most certainly ensured its downfall. Number 1. The Fall While the socioeconomic downturn instigated by the Huns was long considered to be the final nail in the coffin for the Guptas, recent findings have begun to determine that there may have been another reason. In 2019, the archaeologist Shankar Sharma discovered evidence that implicates the regions of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh were struck with apocalyptic flooding, shown by silt deposits with depths from 0.6 to 2.5. 5 meters. Another piece of evidence points to two accounts of Chinese pilgrims which occurred 200 years apart from one another, one detailing the beauty of the region, and the other commenting on the horror of seeing so many destroyed temples. While the Huns' invasion certainly would have killed the Gupta Empire eventually, this flood was likely the final impact that ensured their demise. 